Holy Spirit. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. The Lord tells us many things such as this, that we should just seek the one thing needful, and choose that better part that Mary chose. That where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And his kingdom is not of this world. Paul tells us here we have no continuing city. We seek a kingdom which is to come. The Akathis Tim in the 8th, the Pacquian says, or Eco says, seek a strange child, but to estrange ourselves from the world by transporting our minds to heaven. To this end, the Most High God came to earth as a lowly man, that he may draw to the heights those who cry to him, Alleluia. Translation, we need to have our eyes on things that are important, what is meaningful. We see in that first sentence of the Lord today about the eye being the lamp of the body. That if our eye be single, our whole body shall be full of light. The Theophon says that the same thing in Slavonic means simple. If our eye be simple, it doesn't mean stupid, but it means accepting the things of the gospel. Accepting things as the church teaches them, not subjecting the scriptures to our critique as a corpse for dissection, but using it as the living word of God, which dissects us and changes us. It puts the scalpel to us and heals what needs to be healed in us instead of vice versa. But if our eye be single, means it is very focused and narrowly focused on Christ all the time and all places and all things. If our mind be single in that way, that our mind is always thinking in the light of the gospel. As St. Ignatius Biachanino says, the gospel is always near at hand because we have those gospel commandments always in our mind. If we have those gospel commandments in our mind, it changes everything that we do, every action, every thought, every deed, every belief. And it is very important that we do so. Because that is the way that we become full of light and not full of darkness. When our minds are constantly full of the things of this world, we are filled, of course, with blindness. And that is what leads to these other problems that he mentions. We fret about so many things. We fear everything, especially in this day and age. Our fears are just manifold. He tells us that we cannot serve God in man, <coughs> to serve God only in these things we add to us. St. John Chrysostom, in commenting on this, says, Mammon is not just money. Mammon is every sort of injustice, every idolatry, every serving of our stomach, every serving of lust and anger, anything that is against the will of God. Every slight of our neighbor, every insult, everything that we do is mammon, because it is not seeking God first. We need to listen to these things carefully. Because when he tells us in his mercy that he is going to take care of us, consider the birds, he feeds them, the lilies. Not even Solomon was clothed like the lilies in all his glory. But those things are cast aside, and God is not. God will still be there, and he takes care of man to the nth degree. He knows every hair of our heads. If we are of more value than sparrows, whom he also loves, we should not fear. The Lord tells us, do not be afraid. But we constantly are fretting about money, constantly fretting about what we're going to eat next, what we're going to wear next, the next thing we're going to do for a paycheck. But look at the lives of the saints, look at the <coughs> prophets, look at all of them. They don't fear these things. The people of Israel, even when they feared, were sent manna. The same quail, everything they needed was always given. Athanasius of Athos, this, the monastery is starving. He goes outside the monastery, sees the mother of God. She tells him to strike the rock, and there is water. Sergius of Radanez tells the faithful to, the brethren to be faithful, and a merchant comes by with bread at that very moment. He is not going to ever let us starve. Nothing beyond our means. So why do we fear? The only reason we fear is because our mind has become dark and we have turned away from Christ. But when we turn to Christ, He fills us up with Himself. He loves us, He redeems us. Human nature, which He made beautiful, He takes up with Himself up to His right hand and is willing to stand here amongst us in the midst of all this fall and brokenness, despite the fact that we turn away from Him, despite the fact that we spit upon Him, despite the fact that we crucify him day to day, he still says, do not be afraid. We fear constantly. We fear 
Going to the tomb, Mary Magdalene can't even breathe. She's so fearful because her Lord is gone. She, hear, she hears those most remarkable words. He is not here. He is risen. And that should affect everything in our lives because there is nothing to fear. He is not sealed up in some tomb. He is risen. And he is risen in our hearts. And he has risen in our financial situations, and in our hunger, and in our strife, and the difficulties we may have at work. He is risen, and there is nothing to fear because of this, not one single thing. I chose today, we had several choices of services, but I chose to do the New Martyrs of the Turkish Show for, for various reasons. I think it probably more pertinent now than ever, because in all honesty, has the Turkish Show ended? I understand that the Turks were Muslims and they were killing the Christians, so-called, in behalf of Islam. <coughs> and many, many martyrs died at these hands, as they continue to do in those same lands, by the thousands, as we speak, perhaps even today, we would not be surprised whatsoever. And they are dying on behalf of Christ and adding new martyrs to the kingdom of heaven and new witnesses to our faith. This has not changed. These people were subject to great, great trials. All over that empire, the Ottoman Empire, they had to walk on a lower level. They couldn't have their stores on the same level of the street. They had to get off the street when a Turk was passing by. They couldn't get the same jobs. They had to pay a head tax like cattle just to be alive. And the pressure was constant for them to convert, constant for them to convert to Islam in ways we can't imagine. Perhaps our temptations today are more subtle and they're constantly drawing us into secularism and comfort and things that God did not intend for us, luxuries that we don't need and distractions that we certainly don't need. We have these temptations, especially in the current political system where everything around us morally changes by the minute, it seems, going off the abyss. We still do not need to be afraid. And we have them for an example. One great example of many of them is you have quite a number of them who apostatized, who gave in to this pressure, especially as young people, and did not know what to do, and later their conscience pierced them in some moment. And they sought to renounce Islam, and to return back to Christ, and were martyred for doing so, much as you would be now. This is a great example for us. Even when we fall, we can turn back. We shouldn't seek to fall, we should seek to remain faithful, as many of them did. Last week, I saw, or two weeks ago, I cited one, St. Prisa, or Zlata, who would not accept the temptations that her family was pressing upon her to renounce Christ. A great example. We have in the recent times, Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, who revealed themselves to the faithful in Greece with many, many miracles. No one even knew they existed. They began to work miracle after miracle, showing where their relics were, where the tombs were, told the stories of their lives. St. Ephraim of Neomachri, the same thing. A priest reveals himself who was martyred horribly by the Muslims. I won't go into details of that today. But horribly, for eight months, was tortured by them. He never renounced Christ. He began in the 50s to appear to people as well and show them where he was, and miracles to this day are worked. A few days ago, we had St. Cyprian of Kutlopoceu on Mount Athos, who loved Christ so much from his entire life that he couldn't do enough to sacrifice himself for Christ, so he sought martyrdom. He goes to Thessalonica, goes to the vizier, and they will not do anything. They say he's crazy, they beat him and kick him out. He's renouncing Islam in the middle of it. Then he writes a letter going all the way to Constantinople <coughs> to speak to the main powers. He goes there, they won't let him in, he gives them the letter, they translate it, of course they're infuriated. But what he saw himself as doing is helping his brother, who was lost in delusion. He told them that Muhammad is false, that Christ is the true God, and they martyr him. But unlike the world, when they announced his martyrdom, he ran to the scaffolding and rejoiced and tells them to strike with everything they have for the kingdom of God but to renounce 
their idolatry, to renounce their false religion, not out of any hatred, but out of love for their souls. Timothy of Esfigmenu's wife was taken to a harem by the Muslims. He sought so desperately to get her back that eventually he pretended to be a Muslim, which he greatly regretted. And then he sought martyrdom. <coughs> St. James, the new martyr. In his life, it was the Apostles' Fast, which often a lot of us don't pay much attention to. They wanted him to break the fast, and they tried to get him to break the fast, but he refused because it was against his faith and against the teachings of Christ the Holy Church, and he was martyred for the sake of the Apostles' fast. And this was seriously, that should teach us to take our fast. This man is glorified in the kingdom of heaven for this action, for this devoutness, for this faith, for this single-mindedness <coughs> turning toward Christ. St. Seraphim of the Fanar on the bottom of that icon in front of you was impaled at the Fanar. I don't know of a worse death. If you ever have the courage to read it, not everybody has the stomach, I don't think. For days he endured this, never renouncing his Christ, not for one moment, because his eyes were constantly on the kingdom of heaven. And we have people in our own day doing this as well. These are examples for us. Perhaps none of us are going to be physically martyred. But each and every day in our walks of life, we have decisions to make whether we will be witnesses of Christ or we will just capitulate to the ways of the world and do what everyone else is doing because that's, quote, normal. But it is not. What is normal is to be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That is the norm that he sets for us. Our nature is not sinful. Our nature is not fallen, despite people using that language. Our nature is beautiful. We make bad decisions. And God seeks to raise us up and glorify us with himself by being single-minded and aimed in Christ, by having our treasure in heaven, by seeking his righteousness, by not worrying about every detail of life, of course going about the actions we need to, but not worrying. Sufficient for the day are the evils thereof. Christ is in our midst, and nothing, nothing can harm us and take that away from us as long as we grasp him, grasp his robe with our hands, and never let go. Holy Numantras, pray to God for us. Amen. Amen.